Hello, Shoreline Church. Pastor Walt here. Um, just want to share uh, some experiences I've had over the last uh, eight weeks. It certainly has been an interesting and, and trying time. Uh, in, the, in the very early days of the coronavirus, in fact, in the very first week we were in shelter in place, um, we received word that my mother had passed away, and not from coronavirus. It was not related at all, and, but it was sooner than we certainly had expected, and um, it, it, it was just really a surreal experience it, doing the shelter in place, everybody concerned about coronavirus, my mother passing away. Um, and none of my siblings uh, are Christians. And as we worked through some of the processes and things we had to take care of uh, related to her passing, uh, it was clear that not only were my siblings just on shaky ground from losing our mother, but dealing with coronavirus at the same time and trying to travel and uh, make arrangements to take care of things. And um, you know, more than once, they asked me how could you know a good God let things like this happen everything at once and uh, the more I was asked that actually the more firmly I came down on my faith and the reality is it, I just have kept thinking over and over of uh, a hymn that was written by Pastor Edward Mote over 150 years ago uh, on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is shifting sand and as I look around me I see my brothers and my sister and and other people around me who are dealing with other challenges and coronavirus grasping at things that they used to think were firm they used to think anchored their life that have, are now crumbling around them and and I, I realize even more deeply how much peace I have in the midst of this not that I'm not concerned not that I don't grieve the loss of my mother but that through it all I have this calmness that comes because I know the rock that I stand on will not shift for anything. Hello, Shoreline Church. Uh, we are digging into this amazing book in the Old Testament of the Bible called the book of Daniel. And it's a book about standing strong, an incredibly timely book for right now in our lives. Uh, just listening to uh, Pastor Walt's story of walking through the coronavirus, of losing, of losing his mother, of all that he's walked through, and, and yet his faith is strong. He's, he's standing strong in the midst of all of that. As you begin the book of Daniel, the first two chapters and the first two weeks of our sermon series were about certain kinds of standing strong. Standing strong when the world is crashing down. When you look at the whole world around you, it feels like everything's coming apart and crashing down. Can you still stand strong? And we learned from Daniel, yes, we can in the power of God. And then, and then standing strong when things look impossible, when we say there's no way to get over that, through that, around that. I am stuck. This situation seems impossible. This person seems impossible. This economy seems impossible. And yet God says, I am the God that makes the impossible possible. Standing strong even in those moments. And today we're talking about standing strong when your faith is tested. How do you stand strong when, when there's things coming against the very roots and the core of your faith in God, of your faith in Jesus Christ? Can you still stand strong even in these times? And in this third chapter of Daniel, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to the third chapter of Daniel. We're going to walk through that whole chapter today. And now it shifts from, from stories about Daniel to his three friends, to Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. That's their Hebrew names. That's their birth names. Not the names they were given by the Babylonians. That's their names. And yet these same three young men, they had watched a foreign enemy invade their land. They had watched their city fall to, to, to the Babylonians, to Nebuchadnezzar, to his army. They had watched people they knew and loved mercilessly slaughtered. They watched their, the holy city desecrated. They watched the temple of God invaded by a foreign army and they took the articles from the temple of God back to Babylon and put them in the temple of their God. I mean, th th there's a point in that along the way where you say, how do you hold to your faith during that? But then it gets worse. They're taken as prisoners of war along with Daniel and others to a foreign land. And then they're put into forced servitude to this king who gives them new names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their Babylonian names. 
Their names are, in a sense, are taken away from them. They're given new clothes to wear. They're taught the language of the Babylonians and the customs of the Babylonians, and they're put in service to the king. Today we're talking about at what point do you, do you say, boy, my, my faith is waning or struggling. How do I stand strong through difficult things? They had been through all of these things, these three young men, and now it gets even worse. In Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and I want you just to follow along with me here. Well, after all this has happened, it gets worse. Here's what happens. Daniel 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates, and all the other pro provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So this is a list of all the political leaders, all the influencers. They're all brought there. And so verse, verse 3 so these people, the satraps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. But now here's where it gets interesting. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded, not suggested, commanded to do. As you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So here these three young men are. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. They're in a foreign land. They're prisoners of war. They've watched their land fall. And now they are in servitude to this king. And he sets up an idol. And he says, you have to bow down and worship it. Now here's the reality about idols. Uh, yes, they still exist. We say, well, nobody's setting up a, 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 a giant statue or this giant tower of gold and making me worship it. They, you know, we don't carve out idols out of, uh, out of wood or we don't carve them out of stone or we don't make them out of gold or silver like they did in the ancient world. So there's really no more idols anymore. But here's what an idol is. An idol is anything or anyone, anything or any person we bow down to, we serve, and we worship. When someone or something take, captures our heart, it could be a bad, evil thing, it could be a neutral thing, or it could even be a good thing. Anything that takes the first place in our lives and our devotion to that thing is so critical and so important and so, so all-consuming that our love for God or faith in Jesus begins to wane or be pushed to the side, that thing is becoming an idol for us. And so in this lesson today from God's word, we've got to understand that idols are, can be all kinds of things. Let me give you some examples. If you're dating someone, you're in high school, you're in college, you're, you're an adult, and you're dating someone, nothing wrong with that. They might be a wonderful person. But if that person, if that boyfriend or girlfriend is the all-consuming focus of your life, or, where a young person who loves Jesus starts dating somebody who's not a Christian, or even who is a Christian, but is not really walking with Jesus, and their faith begins to, to wane and soften, and they begin to turn their heart away from Jesus, and that person means so much to them, they hold on to that person above Jesus, above their faith, that person has now become an idol. Again, it's neutral, that relationship, but if that person becomes all-consuming and more important than God, that be person begins to take an idolatrous place in their life. We have to be careful of that. If a person has a glass of wine, that, that, that may not be a, per, a problem for them. They, they don't have alcoholism in their family. It's not a struggle. They can have a glass of wine. But when that wine begins to consume them and becomes an addiction, and when the alcohol becomes an addiction, and all of a sudden their faith is falling apart because of their, because of their love for the drink, for the next drink, for the next, it could, be, it could be drugs, the next high, whatever it is, all of a sudden those things become idolatrous. Why? Because they take the place above God. There's all kinds of things that become idols. Our parents or our children or our family members can become idols if we love them more than we love God. If they take supremacy in our hearts and our lives and in a sense we're serving them, we're bowing down to them as more important than God, that becomes idolatrous. You can love the nation that you're a part of. 
But if you love that nation more than you love God and pursuit of that nation overcomes your love for God, that becomes idolatrous. Now we'll get personal. Netflix, Amazon Prime, live streaming services can become an idol. They're not, they're not to start with, they're neutral, but, it, but if we're watching things that, that pervert our thinking, or if we're so consumed that we go from show to show to show, and now it's midnight and one in the morning, two in the morning, and we can't turn it off because it keeps feeding us the next show, and all of a sudden we're exhausted the next day, we don't open up the word, we're not growing in our faith, we don't have time to worship because we're just consumed with show after show, that can happen. Th- those things now have become an idol. It's amazing how many things can become idols. As I was getting ready for this sermon, somebody mentioned, what about, what about the, the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus? If somebody's consumed with it, thinking about it all the time, it rules their heart and their mind with fear and anxiety. And they don't trust God because they're anxious and worried. That thing can be, take on idolatrous proportions in their heart and their life. Things like video games, a love for sports, playing a sport or watching a sport. Nothing wrong with those things, but if they consume our time and consume our minds and become the most important thing to us, they become an idol. And that's a problem. So we're going to look today at just one story from the Bible. It's chapter 3 of the book of Daniel. And it's this idol that's set up and how they respond to it. And how they stand strong, how Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael stand strong against the temptation to bow down. They hold to their faith in the midst of this. So I call this an epic and dramatic story. And we just looked at Daniel 3, 1 through 6. I call this first portion an idol, an edict, and, a ser- and serious consequences for noncompliance. An idol that's built an edict, what's declared by the king, and serious consequences for non-compliance. Bow down and worship this idol or you will be thrown into a furnace and executed. That's serious consequences. That may seem bizarre to you and bizarre to me, but in the ancient world, kings who were oftentimes held up as deity, most, most of the cultures at that time were polytheistic. They believed in many gods and, and they believed the king was a god of sorts And the king could declare other things as divine. So this king basically says, you have to bow down and worship this idol. That that seems strange to us, but in the ancient world, that was just a test of faithfulness to the king. And so everyone is told, this is now the new standard. You have to follow it. Now this epic dramatic story continues in verse 7. And I want you to watch the response. Watch the response of all of these people who are lined up and brought here for this celebration. And they're told what to do. And look at verse 7. Therefore, as soon as they heard all these, this crowd, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language, notice the inclusivity of that, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everyone played along, and it makes sense. It's kind of a cultural game. It's kind of a political game. When the pressure's on and people are told, you have to do this or there's severe consequences, at this point, everybody bowed down. And one of the questions I want us to ask ourselves today are are, are some of the things in our life, are we getting cultural pressure and pressure from friends, pressure from society where we're just complying? Well, everyone else is doing it. Why, Why can't I do it? It's, it's like when you're a kid and your parents say, well, if everybody else jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? It's like, well, of course I wouldn't. But if everybody else would play along with cultural norms, would you? It's amazing how often we have to be honest and say, I kind of would. But we have to be so careful when that cultural norm, that thing we're invited into, is opposed to the things of God and to the word of God and to the will of God for your life and for mine. We have to learn to stand strong and say, no, I will not bow down. I will stand strong against those things. But almost everyone there bowed down. Now, I want you to look at verses 8 through 12. We're just going to be walking through Daniel chapter 3. This is what I call political manipulation. As the story continues, we pick it up in verse 8. Watch what's going on behind the scenes and try to get a sense of what's happening in the political power structures of Babylon. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, 
May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, a list of instruments there again, and that's going to keep, continue on there, must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. And then they point something out. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's their Babylonian names, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So this group kind of with political influence comes to the king and says, king, there's these people, they're from a foreign land, so they don't really belong to our people, but they've ascended because of their hard work and their wisdom and because of the blessing of God. They descend to a place of influence in Babylon. And you could tell these other people were jealous of them. And we see this come up as a theme through the book of Daniel. They're jealous. They're bitter at these, at, at these three young men because they've ascended to places of influence over them. So they're fi- trying to find some way to knock them down, to deal with them. So they say, listen, King, they're, they're, they're off, off the rails in three ways. They don't respect you. They don't worship our gods. Remember, they're polytheistic. They believe in many gods. They don't, they don't respect you. They don't worship our gods. And they won't bow down to your image that you set up. And you said, king, if they don't, you're going to throw them in the furnace. So uh, the, the story continues on in verses 13 through 15. This is what I call a final chance and an interesting question. I want you to notice what happens next, beginning in verse 13. And I hope you're following along in your Bible or on your Bible app. Just, just, just to walk through God's word together is so rich and so powerful. And so let's pick up at verse 13 and watch what happens next. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? or worship the image of gold that I have set up. So now watch this in verse 15. He gives them sort of a second chance. He says, now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And here's the question then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. And this is your moment. This is your chance. And, and I love it. He says, so, so, so listen, listen. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. He, 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 value, he values them for their political influence. He values them for the work they can do. He's, he's, under, he's put them in a role of leadership because they're valuable. He doesn't want to lose them. But he can't lose face and not throw them in the furnace if they deny to bow down. So he's just going to say, listen, you're making such a big deal about this whole thing. It's, it's not a big deal, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some musicians here. You're going to play a little bit of music. You bow down. You just join the crowd. You do what everybody else does. And I'll get off your back. But if you don't, you're dead. And then he says, and who is the God? What God? could actually deliver you from my hand. I mean, look, look, look at the words of this question. Think about what he's saying. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And his answer is none. He believes there is no God who can rescue you from my hand. Now, why does he believe this? Well, he believes that there's no God that could, that could rescue them because he had never encountered a God who was powerful enough to do that. Why? Because the gods that he worshipped in his polytheistic worldview were idols. They were empty. They were lifeless. They they had no power. He had never experienced God intervening and none of his gods could do anything. And I love in the book of Jeremiah, this won't be on the screen, but I ask you to follow along in your own Bible or just listen as I read this. In Jeremiah chapter 10, we, we get this picture of what idols are really like and how worthless and how powerless they are. Jeremiah 10, beginning in verse 3. Listen to these words, talking about idols. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. This is the the nations around them that that were worshiping idols. It says, they cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nails, so it will not totter. What's he talking about? He's talking about people who made 
idol makers. The people would actually make these idols and they actually have to use nails so it doesn't totter and fall over. Look at verse, look at verse five. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. As powerful as a scarecrow, which has no power at all. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried, but they cannot, they can't even walk. They're, they're weaker than a baby. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. See, these, these idols of the nations, they have no power. They can't do anything bad. They can't do anything good. Why? They're not real. And then he finishes with his sixth verse. But no one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. It's this contrast that the God who made heaven and earth, the God who we gather to worship today in our homes, wherever we are, the God we gather to worship is a God who is so powerful and so glorious and so amazing. And these idols are nothing. They're worthless. They're weak. And so the king says, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Because he hasn't encountered a God who has power. And that's the problem with our modern day idols. We look to them to make us whole and to make us strong and to save us and to deliver us. When a boyfriend or girlfriend becomes an idol, we think if they love me, I'll be truly loved. I'll be truly strong. But that will not happen until you find the love of God and his strength. And when you look to a person for that, they'll always end up empty. If I go to the bottle and drink one more drink, Then I'll feel satisfied. Then I'll numb my pain. But the pain comes back and we're never satisfied. Why? Because it's an idol. It promises power that it doesn't have. We we pursue meaning in a job. And we give hour after hour. We pour our whole life into a job. And we don't realize that jobs don't give us life. God does. And he gives us job so we can make a living and make a difference in the world. But if we make it an idol, it's always empty. If we live to parents, family, friends, people, a nation... If we think that sitting for hours and watching another streaming show or another night of 8 or 10 or 12 shows will make us whole, they won't. Let entertainment be entertainment. Let family be family. Let sports be sports. Let God be God. Because he will satisfy and he will empower you and he will fill you and he will protect you. And you don't have to nail him down so he doesn't totter. He holds the universe in his hands. He holds your life in his hands. So anytime something becomes an idol and our faith wanes and we look at these other things, we are compromising more than we can imagine or dream. And then the story goes on. I love the response of these three young men. In Daniel 3, verse 16, I call this a bold and unwavering response. A bold and unwavering response. So look with me at Daniel chapter 3. And we'll pick this up in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. For if if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But listen to verse 18. But even if he does not We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. All your gods and this image are nothing. We will not bow down. We will not worship. We will not serve. And this is a bold declaration. This is courage. It is beautiful. And I call this three shocking declarations in their response. And again, they're talking to one of the most powerful people on the planet at that time. Someone who at the snap of a finger could demand their life or their death. And they look at him and they say these three things. Number one, we don't need to explain or defend ourselves. They say, King, we don't need to even explain to you. You know who we are. You know our character. You know who we worship. You should know better than this. Of course, we're not going to bow down and worship any of your gods or the silly idol. They're not being disrespectful. They call him your majesty. They're being polite. But they say, you should know. You don't even have to ask us. You know who we are. You know our character. I wonder, I wonder if people look at you and me and say, I don't even have to ask you if you're going to bow down or you're going to acquiesce or give into the things of the world. I don't have to ask you because I know who you are. I know your character. I know your faith. I know there's not a chance in the world you'd compromise like that. They say, we don't have to explain or defend ourselves. And then the second declaration, our God can deliver us 
And we think he will. <laughs> they, they say, our God is so powerful that, that, that if you throw us in the furnace, our God could deliver us. And you know what? We think he's going to if this happens. We have that much faith in him. Man, they believe in the power of God. They believe in the miraculous intervention of God Almighty. Man, let's live with that kind of faith, that kind of confidence. But, but then the third declaration is the most shocking of all. Even if God does not deliver us, we will not compromise or bow down. I mean, this is where it gets deep and personal and, and, and just bound up in the heart of faith. They said, you should know our character. We shouldn't even have to answer this question. You know we're not going to bow down. We believe our God has the power to save us, and we believe he will. But your majesty, even if God doesn't deliver us, will die before we bow down and deny our faith. This is an issue of our faith. Man, man, that, may that be our hearts. May people look at us and say, I know your answer. You wouldn't compromise. I know your faith. You believe in the power of God to deliver, to heal, to do all he says he can do. And I also know that you will follow God even if he doesn't behave the way you think he should. I mean, that's faith. I will follow God and even die for my faith, even if he doesn't show up and deliver me the way I wish he, he, he would or I think he should. I will still worship him and follow him and bow down to him and no one and nothing else. That's faith. That's standing strong when your faith is being tested. Here's what we have to understand. There were lines that would not be crossed. And denying their faith was the most important line. For these three young men, they said, there's, there's, we'll wear the clothes of the Babylonians and we'll, we'll, eat, you know, we'll, 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 we'll kind of understand the culture of the Babylonians and we'll speak the language of the Babylonians, but on certain things we will draw a line and bowing down to an idol is one of our lines. And what about us? Where do we draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Where do I draw the line? I hope that the line we draw is when something compromises our faith. When anything takes this place of supremacy over God and God is pushed down and off to the side. So if you're in a dating relationship and your boyfriend or girlfriend has become the most, the most important thing in your life and all your time and energy and focus is on them and God has been sidelined, something's gone wrong. A line's been crossed and it's time to get things right. If you've gone from having an occasional glass of wine to being addicted to alcohol and it's killing your family and hurting your children and devastating your faith. A line has been crossed. That idol has to be cast down. You have to say, I will no longer bow to that idol. If your work life, if your friendships have become so important to you that they, that they, they are most important to your heart and your life, even in a season like this when, when I would hope that, that people would be proud of their nation and love their nation, but if your nation becomes the focal part of your life more than God Almighty, that's idolatry. It's time to straighten things out. During the season when I can't tell you how many times I heard different people on different stations, different shows saying, well, you know, on this time of our life now, we can all catch up on all the shows on TV. I mean, there's nothing else to do. Just sit for hour after hour after hour and consume live streaming shows. And some, some of those shows are wonderful and edifying, some are neutral, and some are absolute trash. But even if they're the good ones or the neutral ones, if they've consumed us to the point where God is sidelined and they're the focal point of our lives, that's idolatry, and it's time to draw the line and say, enough of that, enough of that. But the story continues on. What I call an angry and violent response. Nebuchadnezzar did not like their response. He was not pleased when they said, you should know better than to even ask us. We know God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down. And he kind of loses it. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He, he wanted to protect them. He cared about them. But now his attitude changes. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Man, dump seven times as much wood in there, whatever it is, and get that baby just absolutely sizzling. And command some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Now watch this little backfire in verse 22 and following. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot 
that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. The king loses some of his best, strongest men because of his anger and because of his rash decision. And they throw him in the fire. And you think, well, you know, is that the end of the story? No, it's not. In in verses 24 to 25, we find what I call a miracle and a hope filled reality. And I love this picture. I love this. You know, one of the worship songs that we sing is, there's another in the fire. They're, they're not in the fire alone. This is a beautiful picture. Daniel 3, pick it up at verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now remember, they're polytheists. They think about lots of gods. But that fourth one looks like a son of the gods. We don't know exactly what that means. Scholars don't know exactly what that means. Some people say that's a picture that Jesus Christ, who called himself the son of man, and also the son of God. Some people say it's an angel. And I say this. I don't care if it's an angel or if it's Jesus himself. The word angel just means messenger. Is it God present with them or a messenger of God? They weren't alone. Whoever God put there to walk, whether it was God himself or an angel, there was a presence sent by God Almighty or God Almighty himself saying, you're not alone in the furnace. You're not alone in the fire. Now what hope that brings. What joy that should bring to our hearts. What certainty that no matter what we go through, we are never, never, never alone. Here's a question for you. How is God with you in the hard times of life? If I asked you right now just to send in a a note to the church and say, "Here's, here's how I've experienced the presence of God with me through the loss of this person, through the pain of this sickness, through this difficult time of life, maybe just through the last six weeks. If we pay attention and notice God is with us in the furnace, in the fire, in the difficult times, always. And sometimes the times we experience God the most intimately is in the most challenging of times where God draws near to you and draws near to me. And then, in chapter 3, verse 26, we get what's the rest of the story. Watch what happens. They stand strong in their faith. They will not deny. They hold to the hand of God. And in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, perfect governors, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor the hair of their head was not singed, and there was no smell of fire on them. And watch this response. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the kings, defied his own command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. They denied bowing to any other god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and this is Nebuchadnezzar's uh, bad temper, Anyone who speaks against their God will be cut into pieces and their houses burned and in, in, t- turned into piles of rubble. Uh, settle down, Nebuchadnezzar. Everything was like, you're going, you're, you're, you're going in a fur- furnace, you're going. It's, but he says, okay, so anybody who speaks poorly, they're in huge trouble. He says, for no other God can save in this way. Nebuchadnezzar has not understood yet that there is no other God. But he says, all the gods we worship, all of our idols, they're powerless. And this God can save. He's so close to understanding that this God is the only God. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Put them back to work again. What a story. What what an account of faith and faithfulness. So for you and me, it's time that we search our lives Are there any things that are becoming idolatrous for us? See, when when Nebuchadnezzar set up the statue, it was a statue. 
When he said, bow down, it became an idol. There's things in our lives that are just bad things we should avoid, but it's those neutral things or even those positive things that when they begin to consume us, our hearts and our minds are given to them and God gets pushed off to the side, they become idol, idols. It becomes an act of idolatry. And we have to say, no more. I stand strong and worship one God and one God alone. Oh God, that's our prayer today. That by your Holy Spirit, oh God, you would show us anywhere in our hearts and our minds in our lives where any thing or any person is taking a place of supremacy over you, where, where our attention and our mind and our focus and all that we are is focused on those things and not on you. And Lord, may we recognize what it means to say no to those things. I will not bow down. And yes to you. Lord, correct our lives where they've gone astray. Give us a new passion for you. And thank you for these three men who in a real time, in a real place, said, I will not bow down. May we echo those words. And may we dare to say, and I believe, oh God, you can deliver me, but even if things don't go the way I'd like them to, I will not bow down to anyone but the God I know and love and worship. And his name is Jesus. We bow down to you, Jesus, every day and surrender our lives to you. And we pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being part of this worship service today. I want to give you a couple words of invitation before I send you off with a word of blessing. If you'd linger for just a moment, I want to give you a word of blessing to send you with, but I also want to invite you, if you have prayer, maybe there's an area in your life that's become idolatrous, maybe there's a joy, something great that's happened in your life, would you either call in on the number that's provided, or would you email in and just let us know how we can pray for you? And we want to interact with you and pray for you. There's power in prayer. Take time to let us pray for you. If you're new at Shoreline, all you have to do is at the number provided on your screen there, just text the word welcome. And we want to give you a proper, warm, personal welcome to Shoreline Church. If you would do that, that would be a blessing for us. Let us welcome you. And then if you want to know about anything happening in the life of the church, is this going to start again? Is that going to start again? When are we doing this? When are we doing that? Any questions you have, info at shoreline.church and someone will get back to you with the best answer we have as quickly as we can. And then finally, after I give you a word of blessing, I invite you just to stay on for just a couple of minutes, and we're going to have a short video just to keep you in, kind of in touch with what's happening in the life of your church. Well, Shoreline Church, as we end this time together, may you stand strong in your faith. May you identify where idols are creeping in, and in the name of Jesus, cast them down. Say, I will bow down no more. And the best way to do that is every day, Bow down to Jesus, worship him, follow him, and let nothing and no one take that place of supremacy in your heart or your life. Walk in the presence and the power of Jesus this week. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow, Wednesday and Friday with the devotions, and I'll see you next Sunday in worship online. God bless you. Have a great week.